old head what's going on hey how you doing man not too bad not too bad cool i I really apologize for the length of uh of putting this together and i i appreciate your persistence very much it's 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 no problem i i totally understand it's I mean, I'm 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 just some dude. You have a lot of things going on. That sort of stuff oh, happens. I'm just, no, I'm just some dude. You're, <laughs> you're way more way more interesting. I'm sure. Look at that record collection. That's fantastic. That's that's a lot of money right there. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> money money well spent, in my opinion. Yeah, I am one of those people that uh, I listen to my records. I handle them and they get messy and messed up and you know i keep them clean but i i don't you know that's it's like a physical thing for me collecting records i don't just do it to collect i love listening to them yeah totally well you know it's like my you know my feeling is that technically vinyl is a well it's obviously it's an imperfect medium you know i i generally think that there's other other forms of stories that sound better but there's something so special about the vinyl, you know, yeah. and the, that really sort of engages you, you know, and, and makes you listen in a different way. That's yeah. well, really, really special to me. Yeah, especially in this day and age, I've, I've found that it really brings me back to that idea of sitting down and listening to an album in full and paying attention to the album because yeah, usually... Right. Especially if the, if a band puts a lot of work into like a gatefold with lyrics and all this other stuff, like you, you know, it takes me back to to my younger years when that's what I would do because there wasn't a million other distractions. It was me in my room with a CD playing, and I'd be looking through it. And so this, you know, collecting this and making this my biggest hobby has actually like brought me back to that, which I missed a lot. So yeah, right. Well, you know, yeah, I mean when we were growing up, that's probably the same for you, but like there wasn't the amount of music available that there is now. Yep. So it was like, <clears throat> you know, when, like when I would buy a record, you know, I, I would put that on and I would listen to it several times a day for weeks on end. Yeah. You know, and really focus on it every single song and totally, you know, get into it side A, side B. I mean, it's uh it's very difficult to do that these days yeah no i i I agree i still uh i still really appreciate when bands you know even though you know newer stuff is intended to come out online or whatever when they put out a vinyl version i still like when i can tell they put some thought into the sequencing of the two different sides because it's that doesn't happen that often right no i you know i always think of of terms, you know, I always think of albums in terms of side A and side B and, you know, opening the, the record, all that sequencing is very important. I know a lot of people don't care because, you know, they think that, well, anything can be on Spotify and people are just going to shuffle or whatever. Yeah. And that, you know, that is the case for some people, but there are still people that love to listen to an album and digest it and, and go through the whole movement of the whole thing, you know? Yeah. I just, I just more just like the, the, how involved the whole thing is. And so, yeah, that's the big deal for me, because like I said, it does bring me back to like, cause I was, I was born in the late seventies. So I sort of came of age as a music fan in the late eighties and early nineties. And so everything was, there was still some vinyl floating around. Everything was switching over to CDs, but me being a younger person, the medium that I could afford most of the time was cassettes. And so even then that was a more involved thing, you know, listening to a cassette, but I just, totally. I love cassettes, which is, it's weird. Cause they're like the worst format <laughs> possible. I don't know. Maybe eight track was worse. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But there's, yeah, but there's something about them and, you know, and being able to dub stuff and make mixtapes for people, you know, and when people would give you a really good mixtape, it was fantastic. Oh, you know? oh, that I would, I would, obsess over making the perfect mixtape because it wouldn't just be songs in a particular order it yeah. would be i would put in you know movie clips or stand-up comedy clips or whatever and i would arrange them in a way that would make this full experience for like my friends and so i actually really miss that i have a tape deck 
but nobody else does. So who the hell am I going to make a mixtape for at this point? Just for me. Right. But you can make, you can make me one. I've got a tape deck. All right. Like, I will. You know, like, uh, very, like very early days of fudge tunnel, probably like 89, you know, like, I used to listen. I used to listen religiously to the John Peel show in England, which was yeah. the, the nightly radio show. And you know they kept changing his hours. You know, at, at, like at one point it was like eight p.m., and then they sort of is you know it's very eclectic. So they sort of just kept pushing him back and back. And and then at at some point it was like ten p.m. till midnight, which is like everybody's down the pub. You know, so I was like, oh, I'm going out, there's a gig or I'm going to the pub, whatever. But I would just record the entire thing, you know, got a C90, record the whole thing, you know, and then the next day, wake up, like, go through all the tracks. If I found anything really cool, I would dub it onto another deck, you know. I was yeah. like, first time I ever heard Sonic U, first time I ever heard Can, first time I ever heard Captain Beefheart, you know, like so much cool stuff. And I know I do still have some of those tapes somewhere. Oh, I so wish I selected bits of, you know, jump here. Yeah, I wish I had some of that stuff. But that, that is a nice transition you just set up there with early Fudge Tunnel and recording stuff while you weren't there because my introduction to Fudge Tunnel was in 1993. And I, if I remember right, I, I recorded the episode, so I'm sure I wasn't at home. I recorded the episode of Headbangers Ball on MTV because I, I watched that show. And that for, for, for me, that was kind of my way of being turned on to like the heavier music, which a lot of the stuff I was into. And they played the video for Grey on, on that episode of, uh, of Headbangers Ball. And at that point, I was kind of a weirdo because I was into everything from like, you know, the alternative stuff, the grunge, the thrash metal, the death metal, like all of those things were all music that I was into, but I didn't necessarily feel like I fit in anywhere. Like I almost felt like I was too metal for the alternative kids. I was too, I was, wasn't metal enough for the metal kids. And so I was always like on the lookout for something that just felt like it was for me. And seeing that gray video, all of a sudden I was just like, not only is this something that's speaking to me but this is early stages of me wanting to like maybe start a band and i'm like this is actually the kind of shit that i would want to play and so it was uh oh, it was nice. it was it was almost like the second because that, that happened with me like a lot of other people with nirvana when i saw nirvana that really hit me really hard but fudge Tun tunnel was like the second one of those where it became even more like Oh, this is this is really what I would kind of like to do. In fact, the very first time I ever played in front of an audience, which was at like a garage party in 1994, the band I got together, we covered Gray at our show. Like uh -huh. that was so that's a, you know, it goes a long way back. I have a long history with um not just that band, but it turns out with you, which is we're going to the interview the interview part has begun if you haven't figured it out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but but uh it'll be kind of like a quasi this is your life sort of thing that we'll be going through but but we'll we'll start because i keep things kind of from my own perspective oh, on my gonna, channel you're not, gonna, you're not gonna bring in my older uncle george are you yeah actually <laughs> he's, right there. he's right there waiting in the wings you haven't yeah. seen him in 40 years <laughs> but uh but yeah so that album was really important to me because it kind of felt like it didn't quite fit in anywhere just like me and so it became and, and a lot of my friends for some reason it didn't connect with them as much as it did with me and um so starting out starting out at that period i know like i know that not only is this far away from you in years now but i don't even know how, how many people actually want to talk to you about fudge tunnel anymore is it like it's less and less all the time no it's really strange it's actually like more and more it's oh, yeah? really strange. like yeah i got i get like emails or there was like this whole period you know through the early 2000s where it's like it's complete completely forgotten as far as the band goes anyway you know yeah and then somewhere uh, you know maybe like seven or eight or nine years ago i don't know i think maybe like people started finding me on facebook or you know or maybe um, sort of people like rediscovered what they were listening to you know 
I'm well, and- yeah, that because that really happened with me because I kind of really grew out of the heavy music scene in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then I came back around to it. And so and when I did that, it also brought me back to like all of the music that I loved. But Fudge Tunnel is always a band that's just been with me, just all, all the things you guys did. But taking you back to to Creep Diets, because a big thing about that album for me is the sound is the the set not just not the sonically but the way the songs are written and played it's m- much it feels to me much more metallic than hate songs or the especially the first couple EPs so when you were putting that album together was there were there heavier influences that like you could pinpoint that we're making the sound heavier or was it kind of like a natural progression with the sound? Uh, Well, that's interesting because I've always felt that that was like the poppiest album that we did, you know, at least like the most song orientated album. It's, it's, I mean, I'm not going to say it's the heaviest, but it, but it, to me, it, I think maybe it's just the way the guitars sound on that. It always sounds like metal to me in a strange way. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like you know, it's metal without the solos or the or the double bass drums or any of that kind of kind of stuff. Hey, be be fair, be fair. There are some solos on it. There's some noisy, discordant <laughs> there, solos some on there. One, yeah, what the one note solo. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm yeah, I'm not sure. I think um, you know, like the the first couple of EPs were quite punky and really mm-hmm. just sort of trying to find our sound. Uh, you know, and then Hate Songs was this sort of big epic, you know, art rock noisy thing. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I think at some point we were sort of like, well, we might want to write like some actual songs, you know. Um, and we were we were listening or, you know, me specifically, but all three of us, I think, were listening to Dinosaur Jr. a lot. OK. Almost, almost uh, exclusively for for a while making that record so i think yeah so that's like you know uh dinosaur jr and and pixies too that sort of have that like okay we're gonna do this really stripped back verse and then this like huge guitar overload chorus Mm -hmm. you know whereas hate songs hate songs was just like guitar overload all the way through every (laughs) song But you know, it was kind of like you know, d- doing hate songs was like, um, you know, like okay, we want this next part to be louder. Well, just step on a pedal, like you know, or just yeah. like overdub another guitar. But then you get to the point where it's like, it's just not any louder. It's just more guitars, but it's not louder. It doesn't have any effect. Mm-hmm. And that was like Pixies and Dinosaur Junior were like both great for us. Where it's like a light bulb went off. Like wait if you make it like really quiet the part before then when you come back in it's like twice as impressive you know so there was a lot more of that like trying to strip things out and that's yeah. you know that's, that's what we did with gray where there's like no guitar in the verse or, or very little you know yeah yeah i mean and and uh and so that so since i was <clears throat> over in america when uh when that came out and that was through Columbia Records over here, so it was a major label release over here. I think in 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 the UK, it was still Earache. Am I right? Yeah, well, it was kind of a major label release, and not really intentionally. It was it's sort of like the worst of both worlds for us, because you know e- Earache had signed uh, a deal with Columbia, where Columbia yeah. sort of had like first refusal on anything, you know, so like whatever earache puts out like oh if we like this then we're going to automatically transfer that over to columbia in the in the u.s so you had no say whatsoever it was just part of the deal exactly and you know my feeling about major labels is is sort of uh you know or, or back in those days it was sort of like well you everybody knows that major labels really don't have much cred mm-hmm. uh, but you know like okay maybe they have the resources that could really help a lot more people hear your band and and they usually have money you know but because because we weren't signed directly to columbia we didn't really get either you know (laughs) they just sort of put it out yeah Um, 
but then the, then it got into like this really strange situation where they they started trying to control us or deal with us like as if we were actually signed you know and you have to do this and you have to do that and we're like but we're not signed to Colombia and if we are where's our check <laughs> yeah I mean really that's like the only real advantage to being on a major for me so it was like we're not getting any checks so like why would we why would we need to you know so there was like this whole thing of like oh the best thing was they wanted to change the name of the band because they were like it's never it's never going to work on radio you know and we were like well, what about butthole surfers that's exactly what i was going to say <laughs> oh well that's you know that's different you know that's different uh you know and and so for a minute we were kind of like okay um so what, you know, so like, do you have any examples? And they were like, well, you know, and we we're like, no, no, come on. And they were like, well, we like tunnel. Tunnel's good, right? So we could keep tunnel. And we we're like, okay, yeah. And they're like, but you know, maybe something that's a bit more aggressive and less jokey. And we we're like, right. <laughs> and they're like, come on then. And they're like, slaughter tunnel. <laughs> Ah, oh my god yeah i was so my br i even thought of a better idea than that and i'm not getting paid for it sludge tunnel come on <laughs> there <you go>. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was definitely an acrimonious situation yeah that's that's interesting and that, but and then but uh from my from my point of view at, at the time because i was you know 93 I was 15 years old or whatever and so much of the really because major labels were kind of like all over the place scrambling to like well well we don't know what's going to be big if we have an idea we'll throw it out there i feel like because of the a lot of those major label weird signings i got turned on to a whole lot of strange music that i never would have heard otherwise because all of a sudden it's on mtv or or it has a publicity push where I actually know what it is. So yeah, there's right. a, from my point of view, it turned me on to a lot of music that I'm like, man, I don't think I ever would have heard this otherwise. I mean, there's there's no internet, there's nothing. There's like, you know, and I was just a, you know, a kid. A kid. I wasn't. I didn't have like cool friends that knew all the hip underground bands. I just kind of went with whatever I found. But um, yeah. but I mean, in the case of Earache, I feel like that's you know that's why their stuff was getting played on on MTV anyway, because of the Columbia deal, because they, because they did. Yeah, because you did see like Napalm Death and stuff like that on uh, on Headbangers Ball. But, oh, right. I didn't know that. Yeah, they played Napalm Death. They played Carcass. There there was Godflesh, I think, had a video at one point on, uh, wow, okay. on Headbangers Ball. So there was a wow. lot of stuff. It was that it was mostly that show because by the early 90s, it was called Headbangers Ball, but it had become the catch all for anything heavy and weird that they don't know where to put it anywhere else yeah. so you would see a video by bon jovi followed by fudge tunnel like it's you know that's just what it would end up being so um and, and that was a beautiful well, time <laughs> well you know those like yeah there was you know after nirvana there was a sort of feeding frenzy where it was like you know anytime you have like a you know a three-piece band with like loud distorted guitars sign them yeah sign you know and we definitely sort of got caught up in that and you know i mean like you said the good thing is there's a lot of people that heard the music that might normally have not you know yeah i mean it would be it would be better if you all got paid but you know still <laughs> but it's um not even like it's not even like being paid it, it's just like you know like let us do things on our own terms you know yeah. let us let us write the songs and we'll give it to you and you market it and we're not going to tell you how to market it because we don't know anything about marketing or demographics that's not our job so we have our job which is to create the music and you have your job which is to market that music to people that might like it you know and yeah. that's all we that's all we really wanted but of course it was like no we want to market the music and get involved in how the music should be, you know? So that was the point we were like, nope, yeah. that's not going to, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I just, how at, th at this point, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny to think about major labels. Cause like, what does that even mean anymore? I mean, 
<laughs> it's like yeah, well, you know I, like ironically like my opinion of major labels is much better at this point because most of them in my experience you know at this point they realize well we should probably just stay out of the way let the artist and the producer create you know and then they'll give it to us and we'll we'll market it and that's yeah. You know, for the most part, that's what I see. You know, a lot of people that I work with, that's that's kind of how it is. And I think that's a much better situation, you know. I mean I mean you especially for that, you know, back in back in the day, like just let us do our thing and yeah. we'll and we'll create something much cooler if you're not like breathing down our necks and trying to change the name of the band, you know. Yeah. I think <laughs> that especially this day and age when you have like rappers on SoundCloud becoming super famous and they just uploaded their song themselves. At that point, you got to be like, yeah, maybe we should just let them do what they want. And and if it blows up, it blows up. But right, the um, smarter, yeah, the smarter a and that's, that's their approach. Yeah. Um, well, ba back to, back to the, to creep diets real quick. Cause we previously, cause I know, I know you saw my video before where I, I was trying to find the original gray video. And it was fun. It was funny. Like right after you and I started contacting each other, somebody posted the video on YouTube. So I finally got to see it again. Oh, and I'm right. like, I'm like, okay, I'm not crazy. This video actually <laughs> exists. But because because now because for a while you would go to YouTube and the version that was on there, I guess, was some earache version where they had just taken live footage of you guys and just edited it together. And it it kind of went with the song, but that was really it. It wasn't like the actual video, but um, it, in that video, because I'm assuming you guys filmed the video in 1993. Am I right? Well, there's two videos for Gray. Okay. And, and what happened was that we uh, we did the original video when the album first came out, mm -hmm. and it was done by a couple of friends of ours who did great work. And, um, you know, we made it weird and funny and arty and, you know, it was, it was really fun to do. So that's what we did. Here's our video. <clears throat> and then our friends at Columbia came along and said, well, you know, this, the, the quality of this video isn't good enough. MTV is not going to play it, you know. And we were like, I'm sure they will. I've seen much worse quality videos than this on MTV. And they were like, no, 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 no. And, you know, remember, this is like old school 90s music industry, right? Yeah. So they were like, so they were like, we want you to make another video that's a little bit better quality and work with like a famous director. And we were like, oh, okay, you know, um, how much is that going to cost us? Because it's our money eventually, right? <laughs> and again, it's like before iPhones or before, you know, any final cut or any of that stuff is you had to work with pros and they're expensive. And they were like, it's going to cost $30,000. And so we were like, okay, how about no, we're yeah. not going to spend $30,000 on a video. Like that's just nuts, you know? And I remember we, we had a U.S. tour booked for the, the creep diets as part of the tour schedule, we had a US tour booked. Uh, and we were relying on Columbia as one of the things that a label does is pay for us to fly over, pay for backline, I let your advance all that money, you know. So Columbia said, okay, you don't you don't want to make a video. We were like, not for 30K, that's crazy. And they were like, cool, we don't want to give tour support. Oh shit. Right, so we were like, mm, can we afford three tickets and rent a van for nine weeks? And, you know, no. So we were sort of cornered into, you know, this, this having to redo the video. Um, and we redid it, hated it. It got played on Headbangers Ball once, one time, at, if I remember, like 11.30 p.m. on like a Tuesday. Yeah, and and I and I saw it. <laughs> Something came of it, you know. But that was yeah. always, like we spent thirty k and they played it once on a Monday night or whatever it was. You know? Yeah, no, it, it was it was Saturday, but still, like it's if I remember right, I wasn't even home. I I taped it, I videotaped it, but uh, 
So that so that so the version that I know wasn't even the original video, and it was it was a video that if you guys had had your say, you never would have made. Oh, absolutely. I think that's the, the, the remade one, the major labor one. Like I think we, it just wasn't really our character at all. You know. That's so interesting just to think of that that one little thing. You know what they say, you know, the, a butterfly wing or whatever the fuck it is. If it, it's like I didn't record that episode, we wouldn't even be talking right now, would we? I don't know. Um, yeah, probably, right, exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the butterfly effect. Yeah. But, um, but the, the question I was going to have about inside that video, so, so it, was, it was a little bit later, because in the video, somebody pointed out to me, like, oh, he's wearing a nail bomb shirt in that video. Was nail bomb already a thing? And now that you're saying it was a little bit later, I'm like, oh, I guess you guys already knew Sepultura and then and Max. And so I guess that you had already started put it started putting Nail Bomb together at that point. Yeah, but I'm I'm not sure because I you know I'm like I'm pretty sure that that video was like 92, 93. But you're but hey, there's a nail bomb nail shirt bomb, on you. Bomb, yeah, nail bomb wasn't until at least two or three years after that. So I'm really not sure. Unless that is, you know, that's it's, bizarre. It's not being, being edited after the fact or something. I don't know. I'll try it after after this is 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 over. I'll go get a screen grab and I'll show you because yeah. I'm all because that because I'm all like you know was this an idea that he had early on Neil Nail Bomb or was or uh, that's it's just so it's so strange. Yeah, that it is strange. I'm not I'm not really sure what's going on with that. Interesting, but but that you know that leads us to to sort of the later days of fudge tunnel and then the whole the whole nail bomb thing we won't we won't get into nail bomb right now but um really when it comes to complicated futility of ignorance which i've always said is arguably the best fudge tunnel album um i just i love the way it sounds um i love that it seems more aggressive but also a little bit weirder at the same time and i kind of like the combination of those two things but um when because that's the thing is that I got that album when it came out. And then because we lived in an age with no internet or anything, it just became this thing where there was this album and then I never heard about Fudge Tunnel ever again. So around the time of making that album and putting it out, and I'm assuming you toured for it, um, what what basically ended up happening to, for the demise of the band? like? Was there things happening during the recording of the album? Did it happen later, or, or was it just a natural thing? Um, it, you know, it's like the typical thing, which is like several different things, really. The, you know, definitely the the experience with Columbia and the Eric as well, who were awful, mm -hmm. you know, just definitely like took a lot of the fun out of everything for us. And then, you know, that whole thing, like, well, if you want a tour, you're going to need to do this. So we'll, you know, before we give you money to tour. Yeah. And so we were sort of like, ah, this is not the way we want to do it, you know? And then uh, after that, I had also moved to the States, like probably either just after recording that record or maybe even before. I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but you know, so, um, it, it was sort of a combination of, of all those things that, uh, you know, like I, for me personally started to feel like, oh, maybe I want to be doing something else or, you know, uh, it just, it wasn't as much fun. And that's nothing to do with the other two guys in the band at all. It's mm -hmm. the whole experience of, you know, by the time you're on your third album and, you know, you have to deal with labels and, and we had to deal with labels. I mean, it was not fun. And, you know, that was, that was what, that was the beginning and the end was dealing with record labels. Yeah, I, I, I've, it, the Eric thing, like I hear some people say they they had a great experience and other people say it was just awful. I'm just, I'm, I'm guessing it's per band or how successful your band is maybe, I don't know. Yeah, right. It, it's, it also depends like, you know, like what you can, what you would consider normal or how you operate your band or whatever you know i mean it's not like you know it's not like we were for gauzy like you know full-on 100 percent diy yeah. but we did but you know we did want to have creative control to a large degree 
Um, and it's not even like we weren't willing to compromise as, as we did with that, that video. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think there's a limit to it, you know. So maybe certain bands, if they don't really care and they'll just like, yeah, whatever, tell us what to do. Yeah. Uh, but then they probably had a better experience. As soon as we started resisting things like, no, we don't want to do that. No, we don't want to do that. Then it became very acrimonious, you know? Yeah. And then we started, you know, having things held over our head about this, that, and the other. And it, it just got to the point where I was like, I, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. It's just not fun, you know? I, and then, you know, and then when you have one band member that's living 6,000 miles away, uh, it definitely it, makes it more difficult as well. It almost feels like like a subconscious thing on your part. Like it was a little bit of like, oh, now I'm I'm feeling distance. I'm gonna make actual distance now. <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, I was just a you know the, the probably the same thing would have happened if I'd stayed in England. You know, I think it was like, you know, a it's time to move on and do other stuff, and b it's not fun anymore because of all the record label involvement. So was was that the same kind of thing? Um, when you when you and Max did the nail bomb thing, was that always intended to just be one album and just a project you guys were going to put out, and there was no plans for anything else? Yeah, totally. Well, it was on my part at least. Yeah, you yeah. know, for, for me, it was like, you know, Max and I were hanging out, and we were we you know we were just messing around. So we would play Dead Kennedy songs, and you know, just mess around with stuff. Yeah, and then you know, uh, we we sort of had this rule with Nail Bomb because I know, like, with you know, I was talking to him and and I was like, look, with Fudge Tunnel, we like we agonize over all these songs. I agonize over all the lyrics, rewrite them over and over. You know, like think about the songs. Does the structure work well? Is it getting boring? Is it like you know, just agonize over songs for months you, to mm -hmm. try to get them right. You know, and, and, and so I sort of said to Max, like, wouldn't it be fun if you just, you wrote lyrics and whatever came into your head, you would just write it down and that's the song. And you, and that's the rule is you can't alter it after the fact, like whatever your train of thought is, that's the lyric. Take, you know, no pressure, like whatever comes out. Yeah. So there was between the two of us, there was just sort of this explosion of freedom or, you know, uh, to be creative with it and and just not give a fuck at all and yeah. and also and also because like I never really imagined it was going to be a record or anything like that you know so it's sort of like it doesn't matter no one's ever going to hear it so who cares it's just fun you know oh I mean for for somebody like me I stumbled upon it at the record store and I was like wait wait Max and Alex are in this and so I immediately bought it and was not disappointed because the, the everything that you're saying about the writing process. I mean, it, it made for a really engaging and, and exciting album. Like it's, you know, it, it, it lives on today. That's probably, I would say, you know, musically speaking, I hear people talk about Nail Bomb in regards to you more than anybody. Although to be fair, I'm the guy who always chimes in when they go, Max's side project. And I go, and Alex. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was, you know, it was a great experience for me. And it was, it was really good, you know, to have that, that thing of like, you know, first idea is best idea. Just, just put yeah. it down, you know, and, um, you know, some of the, some of the stuff, you know, yeah, it does stand the test of time, which is sort of surprising given how quickly it was done, you know? Yeah. But it's, um, you know, really fun and really intense done in a short period of time. And so you know, was the, I'm I sorry, was going to, I was going to ask, was the, was the one performance that you guys did, was that something that like you had to be talked into or was that something that you, yeah, I kind of, I, I don't know why, may, correct me if I'm wrong, but every time I watch the footage from that, I always look at you and I go, I don't think he 100% wants to be there doing that. Oh, that was fucking <laughs> awful. I mean, <laughs> that day, like I was, I was, I was in the middle of a divorce. Oh so shit. I was, like, completely miserable. Uh, and I was sort of talked into doing the show. I like, you know, I like, I just, for me, Nail Bomb was an intermediary thing, you know, something yeah. fun to do. And then I'm going to move on. Like, I'm all, I've already got ideas for the next project. I'm starting to do a lot of studio work and production. And so for me, I was sort of like, you know, certainly 
don't want to go back into like touring and making this a band. Yeah. And you know, and also like Nailbomb was kind of metal, which is not really my thing. Yeah. You know, like I, you know, like I I just I really wanted uh nail bomb to be nine inch nails. I was obsessed with nine inch nails, still am, mm. you know, and so that's all the sampling on nail bomb was all me doing all the stuff. You yeah. know, and then Max saying, you know, well let's play guitar live on top of it. And I was like, why <laughs> it's already there but you know so a lot of a lot of nine inch nails ministry that kind of stuff yeah um but yeah it was you know for me i was like you know this is awesome we do this little studio project really fun and then we'll go our separate ways max is going to go back doing his thing and i'm off doing something else yeah you know but yeah you know i kind of got talked into like we should at least do one show yeah, okay so you're not going to tour with it at least just do this one show and i was like okay yeah I'll, I'll do it but it was like the setup was awful like the sound on stage was like unlistenable like i really couldn't hear anything it was just fucking horrible you know and so uh and and, and i probably was just in like an unfeasibly bad mood in general like you know like generally in life just doing a whole lot of things that i really didn't want to be doing you know yeah and and, and it's not like i would sit around and watch that video but i have seen it you, like once in a while you know like a client of mine will be like we'll be working on something they'll be like oh check out this video i found on youtube and i'm like what is it a cat i'll watch it you know and then it's fucking nail bomb and i'm like you piece of shit. You know, but, <laughs> but then i like you know i'll see this guy and it, it's weird it's it's like well i know that guy but it's not me really it's sort of like you know like if i had a little brother or a distant cousin or something it's kind of like yeah i know that guy yeah but it, it's like very hard for me to sort of relate like oh yeah that was that was me <laughs> that's that's interesting so i guess it, it it answers my later question of why you were not involved when max did a tour of nail bomb stuff over, like a few years ago yeah, um, no, no interest at all it's i mean a pretty much around that point 1995 1996 um you know several things happened one i decided i don't want to be in a band anymore i much prefer the studio side I really don't like touring. Yeah. And then the other thing is I realized I don't like metal. Yeah. And I'm not even really that crazy about like anything that, that heavy. I just, you know, for, for a period of my life from you know, like about 1989, which was probably when I discovered Melvin's, you know, for about five or six years after that, like I loved all that stuff. And, it, you know, and, and, and I thought it was great at the time. Yeah, you know. But then I sort of reached a point where I was like, "There's just so much more music out there, and I'm feeling in a different place, and I want to listen to and and work with with other kinds of music because it's I'm not really like a metal guy." Yeah, I mean, and that makes absolute sense. And like, and honestly, when uh, I don't, remember, I feel like it was at this point. It's probably like six or seven or eight mm -hmm. years ago when Max was touring as Nail Bomb. I, I wasn't going to go because as soon as I knew that you weren't involved, I'm like, well, what? I don't understand why he's doing this. But at the same time, now that I'm now that sure we're talking, really good. I mean, he, you know, he's great at what he does. You know, yeah. they, you know, I just sort of got an email that was like, I think I know what the answer is going to be. And I was like, <laughs> yep. No, no interest. You know, like, I yeah. have no interest in touring with any band. Sure. But it's certainly not one that's like a kind of music that I wouldn't even listen to. It's not yeah. like I'm embarrassed of it. I'm very proud of doing that, but it is, it's such a long time ago. And, my, you know, my tastes have changed so much that it's like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I think that's great. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to see somebody just phoning it in <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it would have been, been even worse than me on that, that, <laughs> that one live video. It would have been like the same thing, like times a thousand. Yeah. So yeah, that, like, yeah. that wouldn't be fair to anybody, you know? Yeah. Well, that well, that it's it, it, that kind of brings us in to the next you know little bit. I'm trying to move quickly. I don't want to keep you here forever, but um, no, you can uh, keep me in as long as well. You have uh, I don't know how long you have on a Zoom. Is oh, I have for I have I have forever. I pay the money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, 
I got the whatever the middle one is where I don't have a time limit because I use this okay. a lot for a, I do a, I do a, a another show with a with another friend from England and we and we do um, album ranking videos where we talk about a band's discography and do like a, it's basically always like an hour and a half to a two hour discussion about a band. And oh right, okay. So we do a lot of stuff like yeah, and um, but so the the whole fudge sound thing, like I said, from my point of view, fudge sound mm -hmm. just disappears and I go on with my life. And then um, a few years later, because I because I knew that you, you you had that you helped with the recording of Fudge Tunnel stuff, so I knew that you did that kind of thing. But then in 1998, a, a kind of localish band that I was really into called At the Drive In put out an album, and I and I, and I remember I saw your name on the album, and I was just like Alex Newport from Fudge Tunnel, and very quickly found out that like, oh, okay, this is what he's doing now. He's recording bands. And that led into, I mean, obviously the, if you thinking about it now, it's pretty funny because like I'm contacting you cause like, oh, hey, I'm this huge fan of like Fudge Tunnel and everything. And you're like, great, we can talk about that. But really, if you were gonna boil down your life to like, what do you do? It wouldn't be, I'm a guitar player or a vocalist or in a band, it would be, I'm a, engineer or producer or whatever like that's kind of what you would that's the bulk of your life at this point yeah exactly it's been much longer doing that than you know i was only really an active musician for about six years like like active like touring musician for about six years yeah. followed by you know 25 years of, of studio work yeah it's so, so much so that I saw there was a there's a, a documentary called Underground Incorporated and there's like an interview clip with you and it says Alex Newport producer and I'm all like you're talking about all these like noise rock bands and stuff and you're saying he's he's a producer <laughs> like I mean he is but come on <laughs> yeah. but uh, but anyway so that that led into like you know that whole career and so I mean and, and at this point obviously I've seen that you've done well-known artists you've done some artists that i have no idea who they are you've been you know, you've, you've gone all over the place with it and um really i guess the big question is um do you two parts here i'm okay. guessing that i'm guessing that you don't miss playing in bands but I, I know that you've done other projects we'll talk about those real quick as well but <clears throat> do you ever miss the process of putting together your own music and and is that still a thing that you ever want to do not necessarily be in a band or touring but putting together your own stuff is that ever a thing that you still feel like doing right well um you know uh the, there have been like a few projects that i've that i've done the, the most recent one was a project called red love which is myself yeah. and, and Matt Tong. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's very much a studio project, you know? Yeah. But the thing is, you know, if you're, if you're going to be a musician and have a band or even a project, like, like Red Love took, like, the better part of a year, you know, to figure yeah. out, like, how do we want to sound, you know? We wrote all these songs and then threw them away and... Like, okay, this is, okay, now we're finding our direction, whatever. And so, you know, throughout that year, it wasn't really very easy for me to work, you know? And, and I think, like, so if you're going to be a musician, you need to dedicate yourself. And if you're going to be a producer, mixer, engineer, you need to dedicate yourself. Yeah. And I realized at some point, like, I can do one of these things really well, or I can do both of them not very well. Because there just isn't the time and creative focus to be able to do both of them, you know? So uh, so that's the that's the short answer. It's, it's no secret that I never really liked touring. Um, and so, you know, the idea of sort of starting a band and do, going through that whole thing, you know, I mean, yeah. The last time I toured the country was uh, 2003 with a uh, band called Theory, Theory of Ruin. Oh, I was going to bring that up. Okay, yeah. I'm a, bi I'm a big, big yeah. fan of that as well. Oh, great, thank you. 
I mean, you know, and that was really fun. But again, it was like six weeks out of my life. And, and you know, uh, we were playing to nobody because nobody knew who we were and why should they? And I don't have any problem with that. Yeah. But, you know, I realized like, okay, I would have to build this up from the ground up and do all the touring. And every tour I go on means I'm not working on a record in the studio. You know, yeah. and I just I got to the point where I sort of realized like this isn't this is not really worth it to me. Yeah. You know? Um in to answer the second part of the question, um, you know, red love is still an ongoing thing. I think both of us have been way too busy to do anything recently, but it is an ongoing thing. And I have started to do some work with um music scores for okay for movie. yeah and i did some some of the incidental music in underground ink was me oh. there was a couple of different people that did music for it um but i just finished a film score uh, a couple of months ago for this movie called the dresden sun that's coming out probably end of this year i think it, it would be famous so okay. that you know that whole thing is is very interesting and and you know like the complete opposite of being in a in a band and you know yeah uh it, it's very interesting you're writing for a completely different reason for a different effect you know yeah and there's, there's, and there's no vocals and no you know no lyrics so it's it's a completely different approach but um so it if anything that would be my musical output you know for the foreseeable future when you when you do when you when you work with a band do you use the word producer is that your is, do you go with that term yes okay because that because i was i was kind of my 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 addition to that question was when you work with bands is there do you is there ever like a hands-on approach where you the the songwriter musician in you comes out and you're like you probably want to you know, only repeat that part two times or, you know, like, like suggestions time, like that. All the time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I don't really call myself an engineer, even though I do engineer, but it's like, I deliberately call myself a producer so that that's clear. Yeah. I, that, I think that that's something that's greatly missing in music these days, it seems, because there's a lot, especially from somebody who I'm still very, involved in the metal scene and listen to a lot of metal especially these older bands because a lot of these bands that started in the 80s still going today but they've started doing this thing now where they all work with the same producers over and over again and it's they're not really producing they're just well we set the thing up to you sound how you like and then there's all these bands where you're like somebody needs to tell them that song doesn't need to be that long somebody needs to tell them that this album should be different in some way to the one before but i feel like it's just become this thing where these producers are just glorified engineers that are just setting everything up how the band wants it so so, so i i i feel like you never hear about producers like that anymore that actually have some input and make it their record is you know in some sort of way just the same as it's the band's record right i mean typically that's why people are coming to me and we'll have that discussion mm -hmm. and if that's not what they're looking for and they just want me to press record and you know i'm not really interested that's yeah um, that's kind of a waste of waste of my time um you know, when I was when I was much younger, I was very punk rock and I was like, oh, you don't need a producer telling you how to do your songs. You know, you you know, you just need someone that that gets your sound. And, you know, and we worked with a few people like that. Um, but then when Fudge Tunnel did actually work with a producer, which was this chap, Colin Richardson. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, he produced hate songs and, and I was dead set against it. You know, like the label were like, oh, you should work with a producer. And I was like, why? Like we know how we want to sound we already had the songs and you know and the label was like well a good producer can help you realize that and maybe like bring out things that you never would have thought of or kind of guide you it's not like it's not easy making an album and i was like eh, don't need anything like that you know and then we worked with him and he was just fantastic i mean he was just incredible and you know he'd say why don't we try this and i'd be like eh, you, know, you know and he'd be like just try it. If it doesn't work, I'll be the first to admit and we move on. 
yeah. just try it. You never know. You know, and I would try it and be like, okay, I'll try it just to prove you wrong. You know, and I would try it and be like, oh, yeah, that's so much better. I would never have thought of that. Yeah. You know, and like, <laughs> there's... Uh, you know, with the advent of the digital technology these days, you know, which is fantastic. And it, I mean, it's a double edged sword. You know, there's there's a lot of people doing so much cool stuff that they probably wouldn't have been able to do or it would have been a lot harder or more expensive to do. Yeah. You know, which is fantastic. But the downside is also that, you know, everybody's making their own album at home. You know, and, I, and like I hear all this stuff and people going, oh, we self-produce, you know, and I'm like, OK, but that's not possible. There's no such thing. And the reason I know that is because like after hate songs, I got all big headed and was like, oh, I'm a producer now. Right. So we don't need Colin anymore. I'm going to produce it. And it was the worst thing ever because it's like you have no perspective on what's going on. There's also like the personal relations with the band that a good producer would be able to manage that situation and say like, you're just saying that for personal reasons. That's not a musical reason or whatever yeah. it is. So when people tell me they self-produced, I'm like, no, you didn't. You self-recorded, yes. Yeah. But self, like to me that like, you know, the whole point of a producer is that it's an outside perspective an objective opinion and, and yeah. if you're if you're self-recording you you're not objective i i 100 agree i so i i had like a different band experience than you did because i played in bands for over 25 years all of which failed in some way or another but i kept at it and kept at it and i just got burnt out of trying because i was always the primary songwriter and usually the person that was trying to keep everything together so over the past several years uh, aside from doing like the youtube stuff and podcast i've been i record my own music and i put it out but i literally just use free garage band and the, the shittiest mics it's just but i make it sound as good as i could possibly do it like a glorified demo or something you know and when i even when i do that i find that you know, I have a couple things that I released like two or three years ago, and I'll listen to them now and I'll go, man, if I knew then what I know now, I would have changed these things about it. And I'm like, it's just because I'm by myself. I'm by myself doing this. Nobody's telling me, nobody's giving me any other ideas or hearing something in a different way. And so even though I'm tired of the band thing, there's that part of me that goes, I miss input from somebody else. <laughs> so. Uh, so so the, the the home recording thing could work for some people i guess but for somebody like me i'm just like it just it ends up me me creating things that i'm gonna obsess too much over and never finish or put out and think ah, i could have done that way better so i mean <laughs> but um but bring it bringing us back to there, there are some people that are, that are really good at, at doing it and certainly when it's like a lot of programming stuff or midi or you know like okay yeah you really don't need a studio to be doing that you know yeah but for me when it's when it's more live like people are actually playing there's a band that's a that's a whole different thing yeah um well just, just real quick because we touched on it really really briefly and i'd like to talk about them for a second um theory of ruin so that was one of the things where i came across the counterculture nosebleed album in around 2002, 2003. And um, that was around the time that I wasn't listening to a lot of heavy music. And even the bands that I was in, once again, I heard that something that you were involved in. And I'm like, how does he know the music that I'm kind of wanting to make? I don't know how this works. So it's like a parallel between you and I, because I heard that stuff. And I'm like, so I remember playing it for the band I was in, like, can we do this kind of stuff? And so, uh, and, and I liked, because it's got that sort of like it belongs on like discord records or something or you know it's not it's 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 got a i guess it's got a heaviness to it but it's got that i guess they could they would label it as post hardcore or something like that kind of thing going on but for that particular band when you started that was that was there a desire to like to 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 be in a band again or did it was it sort of thing that just kind of came together with friends or something 
Uh, no, it was there was definitely a, a desire to be in in a band. I think it had been a long enough time since the mid '90s. You know, like enough time had passed that I'd sort of forgotten about being in a band, or you know, yeah. or, or you know, or I missed it. And um, you know, and then I met this incredible drummer, Chess, and that you know that was so inspiring to play with him that I was like, we have to do this. You know, this is going to be awesome. You know. Um, and it and it was, you know, but again, it's like I explained earlier that you know, I I realized that after a couple of three years, I realized like I'm putting so much time into this, and yeah, like it's kind of not making sense, you know. I also have to earn a living. I'm not yeah. I'm not gonna, you know. Unfortunately, I have to I have to pay bills, and I'm not gonna do it with theory of ruin. Yeah. I mean, and it, and it makes total sense, but I, yeah, I love everything that you guys put out in that group as well. And honestly, like, I really like Red Love as well, but like, obviously that's on, it's like a shoegaze kind of thing almost um, going on in that. And I do, I do enjoy that a lot, but, um, but it is very clear that you've, you've moved on from like rock, heavy rock music and, and stuff like that, which I absolutely appreciate, but um it's it's interesting though because like I I absolutely understand where you're coming from and then you're talking to a, a guy that I'm I still am all about the heavy rock music, um, right. so it's uh so it's inter- it's an interesting perspective from somebody that you clearly influenced me and in things that you did and then the thing the, the the pleasing sounds to us have diverged in very different ways I just find that fascinating um, for some reason I'm sorry. <laughs> I do too I do too. But I'm really glad that, you know, that you connected with that stuff and, you know, and, and for anybody else too, anybody that connected it cause with it, that's what it's all about, you know. That was, you know, for me, like, okay, this is this period in my life when I was doing this and didn't really have any big aspirations for it or anything. It was just fun or, I mean, yeah. you know, like Fudge Tunnel was, was like, you know, we like, we were based in Nottingham and it was like, you go out in Nottingham, there's like the whole place is filled with like drunks and jocks that want to beat you up. And it's just, you know, and we would go in the practice room and just make some noise. And it's like, it feels so much better, you know, I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not the person to go around like randomly beating people up. So that was my, that was, that was my release was to like go and play some aggressive music you know that is and you've 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 <laughs> just explained why i listen to the music i do and and everything because it is it is 100 percent a release because i am the you know essentially like a pacifist i'm not i'm not gonna I'm not gonna be confrontational with anybody yeah, but, right. um, you know, like my mom like my mom couldn't understand it like while i listened to this this stuff and you know not just like heavy stuff but you know like I like, you know, a lot of one of my favorite bands is the birthday party. Like it's very aggressive, but in a different, darker kind of way. Sure. Um, But, you know, my mom was like, how can you listen to that? It must get you like so wound up. And, you know, and I'm like, no, it's really the opposite. It's like I listen to that and I kind of get get those feelings out. And and then I feel so much better. I I absolutely like, you know, punk rock and, and goth and and some metal when I was a, a kid, mm-hmm. you know, I'd probably be dead or in prison by now, you know? So yeah. it's, it was, a, it was a huge thing for me, you know, like if I'm able to do that and other people in the world, like yourself connected with it and like heard that same thing, like that's fantastic, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, and you, so you're building a new studio. Is that what I'm seeing on the internet? There's like a brand new studio. <laughs> Trying to, I thought it I thought it would take a couple of months and it's been I think we're on like month 14 at this point but, uh, but yeah it's just about ready my my first session is in three weeks so and wait, what's the studio called it's called the cabin the cabin okay yeah I've got this I've got this place out in the desert and this was like you know in the 50s somebody had built like this little cabin out there on the on the property probably that was probably where they lived you know like yeah for for a year so we sort of like refurbished that and turned it into a studio spot 
tried to save as much of the original building as we could, but it wasn't easy. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, well, one, one more fudge tunnel related question for you, which I, I think I might know the answer to it and then I'm going to let you go. Okay. So, um, so recently earache reissued hate songs in E minor. Yeah. Um, when they do that sort of thing, do you have any input or contact at all, or do they own it and they put it out whenever they want? Well, I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is with that, it was like, um, you know, we heard about the reissue and they changed some of the artwork, right? And they did one that was like an inverted. I have that one. Yeah. Black and white. And somebody told me about it. Like they've changed all the bloody artwork. You know, what do you have to say about this? And I looked at it and I was like, I think it looks pretty cool. I wish we would have done it white in the first place. That looks so much better. But, but the problem was, the problem was, as you know, the pressing isn't very good. Yeah. The pressing is noisy and it doesn't sound very good. Yeah. And so, you know, so we went to Earache and we were like, well, you didn't involve us in this and this is what happens. So like, look, and we don't want to be acrimonious about this. We want to work together. Like, please let us be involved. Because, you know, I think there's talk about a, a creep diets reissue. Oh, so, like, good. let us be involved. Let us approve the mastering. We'll work with you, you know. And I think the general feeling was like, yeah, sure, you know. And I'm like, or you could just do it yourself and fuck it up and have, like, every collector on the Internet saying this is not good. What a waste of money. Well, hopefully they'll 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 decide to work with you guys. But my my biggest gripe about the album, and I don't even know if you know this about it, and is that on the original vinyl, which I have, the side on the on the spine, it says Fudge Tunnels First Movement. That's what it says. On the reissue, it says Fudge Tunnels First and in hindsight best movement. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and yeah. that drove yeah. me up the wall because I'm like, I, who approved of that? Because <laughs> I'm like, I mean, you know, look, look, I'm very opinionated with Fudge Tunnel. Then you know, I it's it's you can argue maybe it's their best, but don't print it on the spine for Christ's sake. Yeah, really, that, yeah that's that's really dumb. I didn't I didn't know about that, but it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> so that's that's what happens when people do things without involving the artist and things like that get done. But like, even that you would think somebody might have said, well, maybe we shouldn't have done that. That's, that's well, <laughs> you know, some sometimes videos I put out get hit the right people. So maybe somebody who knows somebody from Earache can be like, look, if you ever touch anything by Fudge Tunnel again, please, you know, run it by them first. <laughs> For the, for the fans, there, there are a good number of us out there. I've learned over the past several years that there are some other big fans out there. And once I started talking about you guys are like finally somebody you know other people are talking about fudge tunnel so that's been it's probably going to be on my on my channel one of the things that you know you know there may never be and, and, you know any new fudge tunnel or anything like that but it doesn't matter because that collection of stuff is so special to me that i'm sure i'm going to be you know waving the flag for it for many years um but, so um so yeah, yeah. We just, you know we just we just got our first first ever reform request well um, i mean i i didn't even ask that that's because like, <laughs> that was, that's like never happened and people people are like oh you must get asked all the time and i'm like no like people ask about fudge tunnel but they don't ask us to reform and do a tour you know i i thought people had given up given up on that you know no but i mean we did, we did get one like a month ago I wasn't it's, even going to say anything about that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's for a, a, a festival in Texas. Oh, well, shit. Well, then maybe you should do it. <laughs> it's close to me. Um, anyway, no, I, I wasn't, you know, not, you know, having the conversation we had, I'm like, no, I would never, I wouldn't want you to have to do that for any, for anybody. It just seems like it would just be a, a huge uh, pain in the ass, really. Um, but. Well, just, you know, it's like, I mean, A, all of us have moved on quite a lot. And, you know, yeah. and B, it's just not logistically realistic, you know? Yeah. 
Um, well, yeah, that's uh, and but that's really like all I got. Um, I just want to thank you again so much for doing this, and and it it Very doesn't matter. It does it doesn't matter that it took us a while to get here. It was worth it. Just like I said, you you, you know, the stuff you did has been very influential to me. To be to be honest, like I've been doing a series of videos where I painstakingly tried to put together my top twenty bands of all time, and oh, and F- Fudge Tunnel ended up at number nine. So wow, um, that's pretty good. Just right, right, right below you is Carcass, and right above you is Rush. So, <laughs> wow, okay. you're you're an interesting company. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, thank you, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a blast, and um, it, you know, I'll, I'll keep on the lookout if you end up putting out any more music or anything. I follow you on all the socials, so I kind of keep track of what you're doing with your studio okay, and whatnot. But uh, but maybe we'll talk again sometime. But this has been a blast, and uh, yeah. Yeah, we can we can uh, we can always catch up. Sweet, that, that would be great. All right, well, uh, you have a good rest of your night, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later. I will talk All to right. you same moment. Right. right, cheers. Cheers.